On today's show, we'll talk about Dave's visit to the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, in Korea, and what to do to take advantage when everyone in the world is buying gold, except people in the United States. The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. I think you have a reasonable number of possible, let's call them risk or force multipliers. And I can't tell you which geography will move to front and center, which will be in the limelight, which will be the mother of all concerns. But here's what we do have today. Here's what we know we have in the pipeline. The mother of all debt problems is already here. And the mother of all geopolitical conflicts, (laughs) very interestingly, may not be far behind it. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. Dave, you fly more than probably anybody that I know. And I know there's always this concern that you can plan a three-leg or a four-leg trip, you know, whether you're going to Dubai or whether you're going to Beijing, what have you. And literally, it's still random as to whether you're going to get bumped from a flight. You know what's interesting is I haven't flown as much this last year. And so I lost my platinum status with United yeah. and I've never felt more vulnerable in my life. Do you, you, you think they might pull you off the plane at some <laughs> point at this point? Who knows? <laughs> you know, my favorite laugh of the week last week was the Pentagon awarding the contract to United Airlines to uh, forcibly remove Assad. Oh, boo, boo. Okay. So United, <laughs> yeah, they could probably do it better than 59 Tomahawk missiles. Yeah. I wonder if they should do the same thing, you know, with North Korea. I, hey, you know what? Maybe the contract's out. In the region, speaking of North Korea, you've got a few of our destroyers and now one U.S. aircraft carrier with rumors of more being sent. And it's clearly a staging area for something, if need be. Show of force, perhaps, you know, a muscular form of saber rattling, definitely. And can it materialize into something more? We'll get into that. Well, and Dave, I remember 1992 when you had gone with your father and your brother to South Korea. But you had special VIP privileges. I think you went into the negotiating room right on the DMZ. You got a chance to see some tunnels. I know Don, when he came back, he explained even the guards, that you could view the guards, and they stood behind these giant concrete pillars with only one eye exposed, continually looking at the other side of the border. Tell me a little bit about that. You know, it reminds me of of the way Jim Rogers opens his book, Street Smarts. He says, for me, understanding history and its consequences has not been an armchair endeavor, but a hands-on adventure. And traveling with my dad, that's certainly a part of the family legacy that he created. Our understanding of history is very much alive. It's not from texts. It's from places that we've been, things that we've touched and tasted and smelled and seen. And in this case... We were in South Korea. I think the last time I was there was when I was 15. Right. We went on sort of a VIP tour of the DMZ, and we went to the border, Panmunjom. We viewed the guardhouse from which a showdown with the North Koreans had occurred over a tree that was obstructing a view of the road. Yeah, didn't somebody want to cut it down, and that almost led to a uh, incursion right there. Oh, that's right. Cutting down the tree nearly triggered a war. And just as a reminder, the triggers that create major conflict aren't always predictable. And mm-hmm. you can go back to World War One. You know, here we are celebrating close to 100 years since that time frame. And what was it? It was a terrorist attack. It was, you know, a singular event. And, you know, you end up with the British and the German royals who were on friendly terms and vacationing six months earlier, now sending their boys and girls in to die in the trenches and in France and throughout Europe. Well, and, you know, if you think about it, those guys who were in the trenches all the way up to the end of that war really couldn't explain why they were there. The alliances had been so complex that when they broke down, they were shooting at each other but couldn't really explain the dynamics of why. Well, I'll go ahead and post the pictures on the show so you, you can see them. You were taking the picture. Well, and come to think of it, I was not allowed to go onto the North Korean side. Neither was my dad. We sat on sort of the UN buffered side, and then there was the North Korean side. And I think I might have stretched over a little bit just to take the <laughs> Always picture. Always the rebel. That was the reality is even then there was protocol to be followed. We may have been on the border, but you shall not pass. Do not break the clothes in actual legal terminology. 
Again, history comes alive. We went after that and we explored the fourth invasion tunnel, if I recall correctly. It could have been the second. Well, those were tunnels that were secretly dug so that the North Koreans could invade if they wanted to, South Korea, right? Well, that's right. So the fourth was dug under the DMZ, the militarized zone, and was discovered in 1990, just a short time before we went into and, it. And they were huge, weren't they? Yeah, some of them were very large. I mean, this one was blockaded, barbed wired, mined, and set up with a large machine gun. So you go out down into the tunnel, and they've got it sort of plugged up part way down. Mm. But you're right, other tunnels like it were dug to allow for the passage of as many as 30,000 troops per hour through the tunnel, and were large enough for both military jeeps and small tanks to drive through to facilitate a full-scale invasion. Well, and I think we should remind the listeners, this was an agreement that was reached, but the war never really ended. That war still goes on in concept. Yeah, I don't have my dates exactly correct, but you're dealing with a peninsula that had been thrown into chaos, invaded and taken over multiple times, 14th century, I want to say something like 1392, and then in the 16th century again, where the Japanese invaded, in the 1910, the Japanese invaded again, mm. and held it through the end of World War II, at which time it was divided up. So from 1945 forward, the country is divided north-south, communist north, more democratically oriented south, western-leaning South Korea, and it wasn't until 1950 that North Korea did invade. And so actually what's interesting is most of the tunnels, one, two, and three, I think, date to discovery in the 1970s. So, you know, from the 50s forward, they were still planning a full-scale invasion. Then they found a brand new tunnel in 1990. And, you know, maybe like the tunnels that are dug under the Egyptian, Palestinian borders, and in Mexico too. It's just a question of, you know, constantly it's occurring and how many have been discovered or currently well, in not just tunnels. They're still making missiles. Let's face it. Okay, you either do it through tunnel under the ground or you do it with a missile over the ground. But there's still tension there when you're there, isn't there? Yeah, and I remember being a young teenager and appreciating sort of the constant threat from North Korea. When you drive the highways of South Korea, you can see signs of preparation all around you. The highway overpasses, for instance, are all overbuilt. And what that allows them to do is, in a moment of crisis, come along, blow those bridge overpasses, and block the motorway beneath so that, again, tank and troop transport is very difficult through mm -hmm. the vital arteries of the country. So, I mean, it, it's a country that's maintained a war footing for a long, long time. Since the 50s invasion, which I mentioned, I've been following that formal separation in, in 1945 at the close of World War II. You know, Dave, you talked earlier to us about uh, game theory and rational actors versus irrational actors. Now, if you're going to play a game with somebody, you are assuming a rational actor. In other words, the rational actor would want to win, but not necessarily at the cost of total destruction of themselves. And you talked about World War One. World War One actually started with an irrational act. It was an execution of leaders, you know, in, in Sarajevo. It was an irrational act that actually started a huge chain reaction of wars against what we would call rational actors. Yeah, it's interesting. One of my favorite books on the topic, Arms and Influence by Thomas Schelling, looks at some of the issues involved in game theory. He kind of brought game theory to international relations. Hmm. I'd love to have him on the program. He's still sort of a professor emeritus at Harvard, and I've invited him several times. Now, I'm on vacation. I'm on vacation. <laughs> so one of these days, the conversation with Thomas Schelling will occur. Well, we can't talk to von Neumann, who actually put the math together back in the 40s because he's passed away, but it's math. But here's the problem with the math, because the Rand Corporation puts together the mutually assured destruction, the idea that drove the Cold War competition, the arms race, where we're pitting ourselves against the Russians to build and have just one more bomb than they have. And of course, what that theory assumed was that if we have the equivalent amount, no one will do anything because it's mutually assured destruction. They're rational Everybody actors. Loses. Right. 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 So, but the problem is, and this is, if you look in the side notes in Arms and Influence, my copy of it, you'll find questions all about how you deal with non-state actors, number one, hmm. who may have a different set of motivations. And what I originally thought in terms of was somebody like ISIS, ISIL, Al-Qaeda, the Mahajadeen, I mean, you're talking about groups of people through recent history 
who don't necessarily have a calculated direction. And I think you have that same issue with North Korea. Game theory assumes rational actors introduce a non-rational actor into the mix. And how does game theory work? And quite frankly, anything can happen. You know what it reminds me of, Dave? Did you see that Batman movie with Heath Ledger playing the Joker? Now, he understood game theory in the movie. It was brilliant. He set up several game theory scenarios for rational actors, yet he was irrational in his actions. And so he became a danger to everyone because they had no idea what he would do next. Right. Well, I mean, I can imagine the North Koreans reacting or overreacting to something that the U.S. does. Something more that maybe we have carriers, one too many carriers sitting in the Didn't water. Didn't we send another one over there as well? It's been rumored. What if they connect us back to sabotaging the most recent missile launch, their show of force and sort of bragging rights that we are great, we are powerful, you know, sort of projected propaganda, not only to the North Koreans, but the rest of the world, don't mess with us. And if we were actually involved in, through hacking, having that thing blow up right. on the launch pad, what we're dealing with is a... An entity, a person who's even more volatile, they've been shamed, and really anything can happen next. Well, last week you talked about who benefits and who maybe loses in the Syrian battle, but I've been sensing that China might have a benefit here because there's a distraction from some of their domestic problems. If we get over there and, you know, we're in their turf, actually, what they consider their turf, do you think maybe this has to do with China? A little bit like the dinner with the Chinese leader last week when Syria was struck? Sure. Well, you've got the Mar-a-Lago meeting where Xi Jinping is there and asks the question, well, it responds rather, to Trump, who says, you know, you got to solve the North Korean problem. This is in your backyard. And right. If you don't, I will. And, you know, it'd be interesting to see what the Chinese do with this, because if we took out the nuclear capability of the North Koreans, China benefits immensely from having sort of a regional skirmish without the implications of nuclear war, of course, right. but a regional skirmish, a conflict which is consistent with what they may need for engineered economic activity and production. War sometimes gives politicians the ability to fabricate production and productivity in the economy. Ultimately, I don't think that's healthy, but nevertheless, it gives them statistical fodder. You could almost have the same thing with Trump, couldn't you? I mean, some of the distractions that Trump is seeing right now sure. in the media, if we go to war or something, even if it's a regional war, people will start looking at that instead of, you know, whether we get a budget passed. And I think it's particularly acute in China because you need to distract the population from domestic political and economic concerns have those things take a back burner and as you say trump's policy objectives domestic economic in nature they become irrelevant to the degree that people fixate on conflict and war it's called redirection uh, that's right war is good for that redirection of attention redirection of pressure and i'd like to know the full extent of donald's conversation with president G. You called him Donald. Okay, who is Donald? Who is the real Donald Trump? Okay, <laughs> this is a guy who told me that he didn't like the Federal Reserve and he hated low rates and he thought that the dollar needed to rise and now he thinks the dollar needs to fall. Before he took office, do you remember our conversation on that? We said, yeah, he doesn't like the Fed today, but when it's his economic bubble right. and it's his stock market bubble, he's going to love the right. Fed there and he's going to love low rates. So, yeah, what does he think? What does he believe? You're right. Prior to the election, he was critical of low rates. He was critical of monetary policy managed by Janet Yellen. Now it's his economy. Now it's his stock market bubble. Low and behold any surprises here yeah. no of course he likes yelling he likes low rates right. <laughs> he right. wanted us out of nato again because it was a waste because nato was obsolete not anymore but from the perspective there in the oval office it's no longer obsolete well remember china he thought that they were the biggest currency manipulators in the world if he said it once he said it a dozen times yeah. on the campaign trail and they were going to officially be sanctioned as such as currency manipulators they're no longer a manipulator and it's fascinating to watch president trump in a single breath not only excuse the chinese of currency manipulation but practically finish that sentence with by the way, the dollar is too high and sends our currency to lower levels at the mere suggestion. Well, in a conservative that we've had on this program, David Stockman, who worked with Reagan, he's come out and he said, you know, something really interesting happens on the 100th day of Donald Trump's presidency. Yeah, I sat at a luncheon table with Jim Grant, Bill Fleckenstein, Mitch Cantor, 
and David Stockman in New York two years ago. Mm. And it, it just it's interesting to see the difference in personalities. Some people are slightly more pensive and, and quiet, and you can tell that they're not verbal processors and just more internal processors. But not Stockman. David Stockman is not only man with fire in his belly, <laughs> but boy, is he a verbal processor. I don't think he has to edit his articles when he writes them. I think they just flow perfectly, because actually, when he speaks... It's powerful. It's it's good. So, but there is this sense of irony from Stockman that here we are coming up on the hundredth day of Donald's reign, and it's also the day that government cash runs out and the government begins going into shutdown mode. Yeah, and he thinks that this could be a real showdown. Right. Well, okay. So let's switch over to stocks and gold for a moment. You know, we're in April right now. And every year, Dave, year after year after year, when it's April, you say, okay, we're coming into May, which the old saying is sell in May. And how does that finish? And go away. Yeah, because if you were just looking at 100 years worth of information from the stock market almanac, what you'd find is that there is a powerful seasonality and that there's up months and down months. And if you literally took a portfolio and stepped away and did nothing between May and November, and were only invested for the last hundred years between the months of November and April, that your performance is considerably better, right. considerably better, because this is a season, that season from the end of April, so you're talking about May, through the end of October, where most of your declines occur. So basically you're saying, I've got most of the upside and I avoid most of the downside, just paying attention to that one seasonal rule. So here's the upward and positive seasonal bias in stocks. Guess where it typically ends? Yes, we're coming up on it, April 30th. So how does that affect gold then? Okay, thinking about gold, no move higher in the stock market, or certainly a move lower in stocks shines a very bright light, a spotlight on gold here in the U.S. Asia has been buying really long before the North Korean tensions were on the rise, mm -hmm. and there may be increased buying in that region, depending on the results and, you know, if this moves towards an outright conflict. As we discussed a few weeks ago, we've seen Chinese delivery off the Shanghai Exchange, which has been very strong here in the early part of the year. And what that indicates is a, a strong demand for physical metals in China. Well, and I think you should differentiate, Dave, because you were there for the grand opening of the Shanghai Exchange. You were an invited guest. And the difference between the Shanghai Exchange and the futures market here, which really controls the price on paper of gold. Explain the difference a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, it does have more of an emphasis on physical metals themselves. I mean, clearly they still trade in paper contracts, right. but they have a series of contracts which actually settle in kilo gold bars. That's why Sharia law is allowing Shanghai exchange contracts and not New York futures contracts. Because it ties to the real thing as opposed to just sort of the paper game. So, right. I mean, yeah, it's one of the distinctive qualities of Asian and specifically Chinese market buying that physical component is there versus the Western proclivity to play with paper or futures contracts. You know, we trade for fun and profits. That's kind of how we play in the metals market. And they seem to be building a significant position, have been for years. Yeah, they're not satisfied with the 500 to 1 ratio of paper ounces versus, you know, the ounces that actually exist. You know, this is a topic that we were talking a lot about sort of in 2007 and 2008 when we launched the commentary. Kevin, it, it was the 19th century belonged to the British, the 20th century belonged to America and the 21st century belongs to Asia to some degree. Who had the gold in all three of those occasions? And that's why I mention it, because as my dad used to say, this was kind of one of those breakfast table conversations. He who owns the gold makes the rules. Hmm. So today you see a gradual shift of gold. Tomorrow you see a gradual shift of political power that follows the money and the economic influence. Hmm. And, and so it's a gradual thing. But we wake up in 2035 or 2040 and we wonder what happened. And those shifts are so slow as to be imperceptible to us who care about what happens on the day-to-day -day basis, but actually something monumental, tectonic, was occurring. Dave, since the 80s, when I first started here, I've imagined if I ever were an author, and I'm really not an author, I would love to write a book from a one-ounce gold perspective throughout history, because gold never really is destroyed. It's remelted, it's reconformed, but, you know, sort of trace it back from the second chapter of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, you know, through David and Solomon's kingdom, and moving through back 
Babylon and then, of course, through the Roman Empire, Greek Roman Empire, and ultimately going through and coming into the 20th century. The only chapter I would not like is the chapter where I was converted into the golden toilet seat in Saddam Hussein's palace. <laughs> you had to go to the bad place? Okay, since we're going to go to the bad place, let's go back to stocks. Okay, sell in May. Right, well, back to equities. So you generally have an optimistic first quarter. And when your corporate execs are talking about their prospects for the year, they look at their full year earnings expectations, and they're very, very enthusiastic to start the year. Yeah. And that kind of sets the tone. But it also plays into that part of sell in May, that adage, because it's all too common for executives to hope for the best early in the year and mm -hmm. then have to adjust to reality throughout the year if need be. So very rarely, very rarely do you find a management team who in the first quarter gets out in front of a slow patch and sort of acts as a herald. Because what that would do is really cause them problems in management of the business, the raising of capital and increasing their cost of capital in sending investors fleeing. So you want to start the year with the best news possible and then kind of adjust to reality from there forward. But it's why kind of the best is in. <laughs> by the time you get to this May period. Well, I have a question. Okay, not all of our guests get it right all of the time. They're human. And Russell Napier, early in the year, when we saw just the momentum that was coming into this Trumptopia, I call it, okay, it's almost a utopia mentality with Trump. Napier predicted a much higher dollar price, and we haven't seen that yet. In fact, Trump is down-talking the dollar right now. That seems to be helping gold a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, I think there's some things that are supportive in the short run, but not necessarily defining for the trend. And so last week, you know, Trump jumps on that bandwagon, weak dollar comments, and again, supportive, and certainly maybe boost by a few dollars or a percent, but they're not defining. How about the conflict in North Korea, Syria, Afghanistan? Fair question, but I still think you've got the missile strikes and the bombs dropping. These are tension creators, which are good for a few days of movement in the metal price. But people aren't panicking yet, are they? No, and it's raw fear. When you're talking about geopolitically influenced moves, really geopolitically influenced moves, it's raw fear that drives the price of gold higher. And we don't have that. Concern is different than fear. Mm. And I look at the move from 1050 to 1275, going back to December of 2015 to more recent numbers, and it's been predicated on buyers searching for value and finding it in the price of gold. Mm. So most other assets are priced to perfection. You've got stocks and bonds, which have ridden an eight year wave of increase. And basically what you're talking about is low rates, which have continued to embolden risk takers to the point of amnesia. Well, aren't we getting close to a record on stock market rising years? I mean, we're yep. eight or nine years into this. As of March 9th, we entered the ninth year of stock market increases. That's long in the tooth by any measure. Not only are we on borrowed time, but it's dependent on borrowed money and at very low rates. So I think any thinking humanoid would look and say, uh, raising rates, what does this do to change the equation? To me, it's fairly obvious. If the equation has been dependent on cheap money to this point and you're now making the cost of capital rise, you got to change the result. The result in the equation changes. Well, and all eyes have been on the stock market. We will sound like a broken record on this because people are still talking about stocks more than they are gold and silver. But silver has outperformed the stock markets, and gold has as well. Let's say at least 12% for silver. That would put it in sort of a top performer class. Gold's, Just since the beginning of the year. Gold's doing well, up over 11% compared to equities. They have been outperforming all of the indices, even NASDAQ, which with taking a few points off in the last week or so, is up still around 8%. It hmm. takes missiles and it takes bombs dropping for anyone in the news media to ask the question about gold. I was on a radio interview earlier this week and the host, with a very critical tone, described gold's performance as disappointing. <laughs> And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, what context, what time frame, what are you talking about? The bombs fly and it's not up $150 an ounce. It's not a hedge against political or geopolitical uncertainty. What gives was basically the question. Okay, so it's true. It's only up 2% since the missiles flew. And last week's a big bomb was dropped in Afghanistan. 
But the bigger picture is the bigger deal. You've got the 65-week moving average, which has been rising since January and is now moving substantively higher each week to the current levels around 1,254. And that moving average has long indicated whatever the trend is in play, whether it's a long-term uptrend or a long-term downtrend. You know, we talked about an analogy, Dave, of how long it takes to turn or to stop one of those big oil tanker ships. And it can take, what, five miles to stop one of those things or to begin turning one of those. And the 65-week moving average is like that tanker. It took about 18 months for the moving average to turn down. So the price peaked in 2011, late in the year, and yet the moving average didn't roll over and start moving down until 2013. But once it does, you've got the momentum for years sometimes. Unfortunately, or in this case, fortunately, because here we have the price reaching a low, December 2015, right? and the price has been rising since. Only did the moving average begin to move up January of this year, so it took about a year for it to turn. It's an indication of a long-term trend. So we're at 12.54 on the moving average, which sometimes really serves as a nice floor if there's market moves up and down, right? That's right. So there's plenty of volatility that exists between here and the moving average moving past 1,900 on the ounce price, but I think the moving averages are, at this point, supportive to the case of the secular trend in gold and silver re-emerging. So you right. get the history of markets, which seem to be moving from a lack of imagination for what can be to imagination on steroids. And again, it's you look at the sentiment in the gold market, people don't have an imagination for it moving higher. People do have an imagination for the stock market going to the moon. You juxtapose those two things and see how radically it can be because 2008 and 2009, Baby was going out with the bathwater. Nobody wanted to own stocks and everyone wanted to own gold. We've shifted sentiment. Now you can't imagine anything other than what is in play. Well, and you're talking about American sentiment only. We sometimes can be very cloistered in the way we think. But if you look at the rest of the world, gold import numbers are up not only for China. You discussed that last week, but they're up for India. They're up for Russia. I mean, even the central banks right now are net buyers of gold. Well, that's right. Following the Modi monetary debacle last year, gold import numbers into India have picked up again. And I'm still reading reports of limited cash availability within Mm. the economy, people going to ATMs, and it's kind of a one in 10 crapshoot if there's any money at all available. And, you know, we mentioned recently that following the restrictions, the increased fees for gold imports into India, normal consumption through the normal channels has returned. And on top of that, if you look on a broader basis, central bank accumulation around the world and particularly in the emerging markets, it continues. And it's not sort of one part of the world, it's the globe. Not at the feverish levels we had a few years ago, but still well above the trends of more than a decade ago, where they were in fact dumping the asset, treating it as worthless. And quite the opposite is true today. You've got accumulation, which is the trend. That that leaves us with really the compelling case for the investor. The investor is the swing vote in the gold market. So give the average investor a reason, any reason to own the asset and a lot of progress in price is made because you're talking about the directional trend of price being made at the margins. And if the investor is that swing vote, very little buying at the margins has a big impact on price. You know, Dave, as long as I've known you, you have this unique ability to scout around and say, okay, what's the trend And now? Are there still any laggards or is there any opportunity in the trend? I remember even when we went to Argentina a couple of years ago, we went into this little wine shop and you were looking for a deal on not a cheap bottle of Malbec, but you wanted a deal on it. And I remember how you talked to the owner, scouted it out. You ended up buying a very nice bottle of Malbec for a much better price than probably you could have gotten anywhere else. And so you scout these things out. In fact, I've even known you to wear shoes that are two sizes too small because you got a good deal on them. But we're, we're, we're not going to go there. Okay. <laughs> your pain wasn't really your gain in that particular case. But gold imports are up. Everyone's interested in gold worldwide. No one's interested in gold in the United States. Is there some way for us to capitalize on something that's undervalued in that case? Yeah, I just want to set the record straight that the pair of cycling shoes that I bought that were two sizes too small, I was on a very different budget when I was 18 
and it just made all the sense in the world. <laughs> so that, that was many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And buying quality at a very reasonable price and being able to endure more pain than most. Yeah. I mean, that, that fits sort of the 18 year old profile. I hope that I'm not such a sucker for a deal anymore. What's your point? The buyers today are still predominantly outside of the United States. Right. And this has opened a very unique opportunity. Once in a blue moon, you have the premiums on U.S. product. I'm talking about the older U.S. $20 gold pieces. They get crushed by lack of demand. And because of the size of that market, the premiums above the raw gold value can swing from extreme undervaluation to extreme overvaluation. Because it's a very small market. And when people want it, they want it. And when they don't want it, you can't give it away. Well, it's actually a very healthy indicator as to who's buying what and where, because you have very low volumes coming into the gold market here in the United States. But that's not true if you're talking about a European space where they're still worried about zero interest rates or, you know, conflict between Asia, potential economic issues relating to the French election, which is just coming up in the next few weeks. And there's a variety of reasons why Europeans look at gold and they're buying it. There's a variety of reasons why Asians look at gold and are buying it. There's a variety of reasons why it's not being bought here. And I think the chief reason among them is the Dow Jones industrial average is near all time highs. Right. right. But again, going back to these premiums, premiums are at a very low level presently. And in my opinion, they offer a compelling value play. I mean, I've moved out of most bullion gold into that kind of product for the purpose and here's the real strategy here right. for the purpose of repositioning back into bullion with more ounces, basically. Right. When the premiums are higher, taking the added premium value and buying more gold with it. Well, why don't you answer for the listener what actually triggers an increase in premiums? Because we've been through amazing increase. Well, just since 1987, since I've been here, I've seen it a number of times where the premium can skyrocket, not just a few percent, but hundreds of percent. Yeah, I mean, it happens as a consequence of the U.S. buyer returning to the gold market. Right. Prices are cyclical in all assets. I mean, just keep this in mind. You need to understand this as an investor. Prices are cyclical in all assets. Knowing where you are in the cycle helps tremendously, right. which is why as insiders in the gold market, this is kind of a no brainer for us. What I'm doing is turning a static gold position into a dynamic one. I want to capture the premium on those coins over the next few years and turn it into more ounces. These are free ounces. Having an ounce generating strategy in play is helpful when you're waiting for the prices to improve. Well, and you haven't just done it with rare coins. You've done this with various types of silver. You've done it with platinum and palladium. Let me clarify one thing. Even though they are in the category of rare coins, we are talking about something that is semi rare because we're not talking about something that is, you know, completely esoteric and for two collectors on the planet and only those two are willing to bid it up. Right. We're talking about something that is far more commoditized, common date US twenties. That is really the sweet spot because you have liquidity along with this advantage of not only premium appreciation, but also price action given the metal itself. But you're right. I've done this same thing on a smaller scale with silver, with junk silver. And I mean, three times in the last 10 years, three times in the last 10 years, I've considerably grown my silver position in ounces because the premiums on the bags increases. And if I can buy it at less than 5%, and I can sell it at between 12, 17, 20, 30 percent over the silver price. Guess what I'm doing? Right. I'm taking those premium dollars, putting them into the most generic silver position possible. And I end up with a bunch of free silver. And then as soon as the premiums on the bags dissipates, I go right back into the bags, reload, and I'm ready for that again. And you compound ounces every time you do that. That's but, right. But you're looking for a value different than most people look. Most people are looking at dollars and cents when they're looking for value. But you look at value relative to other things. Right. I think many investors view value as the price that you pay. And I think certainly Amazon and Walmart reinforce that as a mindset, as a certain cultural trend. And I want to challenge that with the notion of value being what you get for what you pay. Mm. And having been in the precious metals market for nearly 50 years as a family, we've learned a few things that add tremendous value 
in the context of a consultative relationship. But you're also careful to look at proper portfolio representation in the various assets. That's where it begins. If you have proper portfolio construction on the front end, I mean, again, it's one thing to sort of you pick who's got the cheapest price on a Krugerrand or a Silver Eagle. That's fine. If what you want is a static portfolio and gold ounce exposure, perfect. I don't criticize that one bit, but you are choosing static versus dynamic, and you don't have the ability to compound your ounces. Well, and there's one thing that can rise. It's the, the price. gold price or what have you. But when you have something in this older form of coin, you have a double play. Right. And I mean, by older coin, again, if we're talking gold, we are talking $20 gold pieces and things like that. If you're talking silver, this is pre-64 dimes, quarters, and 50 cent pieces. Or the silver dollars that your grandma gave you. This is not esoteric. Right. It's just finite. And because it's finite, it's subject to exaggerated rules of supply and demand. So ultimately, the gold market is the same thing. Subject to the rules of supply and demand, if investors come in and buy more than is available, then the price goes up. Right. We're talking about a subset to the gold market, which is smaller in size, and the moves in price are more exaggerated. So that's what we're talking about in terms of a double play. Proper portfolio construction, what do you want? If you want a static portfolio, then ignore this. If you want a dynamic portfolio built in that gives you a double play, a play on price, and a play on relative scarcity, which feeds premium increases and decreases, guess what? That volatility is your friend. Right. And if you like free gold and silver, that's what you have to build into a dynamic portfolio. Well, so that's where the new dollars need to be coming in. If I were putting new dollars into the market, I think certainly bullion is a good option yet it lacks the dynamic we just described. It's a one-dimensional play on price. Again, if that's what you're looking for, great. Ultimately, we are talking about a play on scarcity on both of these bullions, just a larger pool to play in. Mm -hmm. As an industry insider, I'm always looking at ways to maximize my own portfolio allocations in the metals, and we've seen these premium swings occur many times through our five decades of business. Okay, but people are distracted right now, Dave. They're looking the other direction. This is why those prices are so low. They're looking at the stock market and saying, hey, did you see? Yeah, well, the U.S. investor is completely enamored with the U.S. stock market for the present. And I think that love affair basically captures all or most of the investing public's bandwidth. They don't have space to think about. And quite frankly, there's a lot of positive optimism relating to Trump. Hey, Trump's going to fix the world. He's going to make it a peaceful place. Everything's going to be better. The economy is going to grow forever and ever and ever. Right. And you know what he represents? He represents a change from what we had for the last eight years. So I can appreciate there being a sense of relief. relief yeah, right? relief. Now, having a sense of relief, this is an emotional experience. Let's acknowledge that emotional experience is and can be different than practical reality. We still have to see which of his proposals will be put through the legislative process, which of his proposals he forces through by executive order stand in the courts, right? So it's not as easy as being starry-eyed and saying, I'm going to change everything for the better. You still have to deal with the morass, which is our capital city back in the East Coast. So again, the love affair that people have with the stock market, I think it has them blinded to the opportunity, which we look at. It's an opportunity for someone who's willing to ask the question, <laughs> basically ask the question about the market consequences of a lopsided bet. Right. When everyone is piling into one asset class with one particular perspective, you're going to find other pockets which are completely neglected. Gold is neglected in the U.S., you said it. Gold is not neglected overseas, right. but it is being neglected in the U.S. And as a consequence, U.S. products like the American 5s, 10s, $20 gold pieces, they're exaggeratedly cheap because, again, when one asset class is getting the attention, another is neglected. And that, my friend, is the domain of a value investor looking for the neglected, looking for perhaps the hidden beauty. Okay, so let me play the other side of this, though. Let me be the skeptic here. Is there a possibility that the current circumstance remains the case? You know, in other words, that the premiums, they just never come back. Yeah, that's a possibility. I mean, if the stock market continues to capture the imagination of the American investor indefinitely, then within the U.S. market, gold will remain neglected. And the pocket of value I'm describing, it's going to remain too cheap a lot longer. Right. So the question is, how high can the stock market go? Well, there you have it. The question is not only how high can U.S. equities go, but how long can they remain at overvalued levels? We've already said that the margin 
time bomb is already ticking, right? right? $528 billion as a percentage of stock market capitalization, as a percentage of GDP, or just in nominal terms on all three measures. That's borrowed money. To get a comparison back to every other peak in stock market history, we've blown them all out. Mm-hmm. So you have more borrowed money today in the stock market than you had as a percentage of stock market capitalization, even in 1929. And every time it got to this level, or it hasn't gotten to this level, it was lower than this, it always crashed. You're paying interest on half a trillion dollars, right? right? So the reality is that has to be unwound. That has to be unwound. And so we do have a certain time frame in mind. What is the time frame? How long can it last? That's really a question for psychologists. It's really a question for sociologists. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, you remember the scientist's befuddlement. Was it Isaac Newton, who was sort of describing the manic behavior of the markets? I can calculate the motion of heavenly bodies, which you, in fact, like to do. <laughs> <laughs> but not the madness of people was the end of the quote. It, it's frustrating for mathematicians. This is why the Federal Reserve people act like they've really got this thing figured out because they're mathematicians. But OK, so let's go back to a little bit of solid value math. Dave, you've always talked about the Dow to gold ratio as a great way to see whether the Dow is overvalued or gold is undervalued or vice versa. Just review that again. We've always put the context for a Dow to gold ratio at five to one, four to one, three to one, that context being driven by economic concerns. Mm-hmm. And historically, that's been the case. You get to those levels on the basis of the math involved, on the basis of economic and financial problems, right? But for the ratio to collapse to a one-to-one level, geopolitics has to be in the frame, in our opinion. And that's a great point, because back when we had the one-to-one ratio last time, that was 1979. That was the invasion of Afghanistan by Russia. It was a geopolitical event. It was a geopolitical event, because everybody in Saudi Arabia, everyone in the Middle East thought to themselves, we're getting ready to lose access to black gold. We better have the real stuff and ship it to Switzerland, because if we don't have real gold and we don't have access to our oil money, right. uh, we're doomed. How do we maintain a $50 million you know, annual budget? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tough lifestyle. Well, yeah, and it's probably 100 or $150 million now annual budget. But, uh, okay, so 5 to 1, 4 to 1, 3 to 1, relative, okay, so 3 ounces of gold buying the Dow. That's a reasonable rate to get to, even without some sort of large geopolitical event. Right, there has to be a level of concern that drives simultaneous liquidation of risk assets like stocks and the accumulation of safe haven assets like gold to a level where prices simply don't matter. What do I mean by prices don't matter? On the one side of the equation, you've got stock investors who don't want to own anymore, and they're just saying, just get me out. I don't care what the price is, just get me out. It it doesn't matter what the bid is, just get me out. And on the other side of the equation, it's just get me in. Right. And we've seen it. We've had millions and millions of dollars wired to us in a single day where people are in queue for whatever product is available. Just get me in. Just get me in. Just get me in. We know what the manic stage of a gold bull market looks like, and it did not occur in 08, 9, 10, and 11. It did not occur. I repeat, it did not occur. We've been around long enough to know what it looks like and feels like, and there is psychology and sociology involved. What I'm suggesting is that when you survey the geopolitical landscape... Yeah, let me do a Rorschach test of geopolitical landscape right now of potential problems that could drive us to a one-to-one. Let me just throw something out. Okay, Syria, Iran... Yeah. Russia, China, North Korea, Turkey, even the European continent. Right. Well, I mean, Turkey, you've got the dictatorial powers, which were granted to Erdogan over the weekend. That's right. kind of significant. You've got the French election, which may change Brexit to Frexit and completely implode the Frankenstein, which is what Ian McCavity called the euro, which right. was this mix mash of currencies melding together. Frank and Stein, get it, German. <laughs> yeah, it was a good play on words. Right, so that he was always good at that. You're right, the Middle East is just a grand cluster. I mean, you've got Syria, Iran, those are in the front pages today, but it could be any number of countries tomorrow. I think you have a reasonable number of possible, let's call them risk or force multipliers. Right. And I can't tell you which geography will move to front and center, which will be in the limelight, which will be the mother of all concerns. But here's what we do have today. Here's what we know we have in the pipeline. The mother of all debt problems is already here. And the mother of all geopolitical conflicts, (laughs) very interestingly, may not be far behind it. 
Thank you for listening to today's McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. We'll see you next Wednesday. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at ICA Gold for our latest updates and market thoughts. You can also follow David at David McIlvaney. If you want to learn more about us and what we do, visit us online at McIlvaney.com, spelled M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. Or if you have questions about precious metals or other financial questions, give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.